we're going to make a start. And um, our first session, macro data. So get ready for some numbers. And Debbie is kindly going to chair this session. So over to you, Debbie. And the first um, presenter is Sharon. Uh, Sharon Liu, um, she's also affiliated with the ANU, um, and sh her works covers aid and economic development in the Pacific and um, previously. She also works for the Asia Foundations and have, yeah, um, lots of on the ground experience, yeah, in different areas. So I will pass the time to her now. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Sharon. I'm from the Devon Policy Center, um, and I'm very happy he to be here to talk about my paper on foreign companies in Papua New Guinea. For this paper, I examined the um, trans drivers and issues of foreign companies' engagement in Papua New Guinea. Um, we have a strong focus on the Chinese company, which is the biggest player in the market, um, and also um, we specifically look at Chinese um, um, the traditional players like the Australian and Malaysian companies, and also an emerging player, the Indian companies. For the purpose of this conference, I will talk more about Chinese companies. Um, so Papua New Guinea is a um, Pacific Island country with rich resources. Um, but very poor development. There is a lack of data and information about foreign companies in general. Um, and with the heightened international attention to the region, there is strong needs for people to really understand about foreign companies' operation to um, bring up the foreign investments and also to better engage with the companies. So because of this purpose, the Asia Foundation has funded this project to, um, to really find the Pacific solutions to the Pacific challenges. In this presentation, I will first give an overview of the foreign companies in Papua New Guinea in terms of its number, scale, sector, and location. And now I will examine factors affecting the engagement from three angles. Papua New Guinea's economic development and business environment, state diplomacy and economic incentives, and bilateral trade and international transactions. Um, lastly, I will briefly talk about the engagement issues and measures that have been put in place to address them. Moving next, um, I used the registration data from the PNG Investment Promotion Authority. Um, the data was retrieved in 2022, and I counted about 1,800 companies in Papua New Guinea, of which the controlling shareholders are Chinese nationals or Chinese entity. That is a lot higher than companies from other countries. Um, according to the China's official guide to investment cooperation in Papua New Guinea, which is issued by the Ministry of Commerce, there is only about over 30 Chinese companies in 2021. The big difference in number is the large number of Chinese SMEs, um, and which is not really being included in the official reporting. So the number of, um, this chart shows the number of newly registered foreign companies each year. Um, and we can see that Chinese companies, they are actually the late commerce to the market. Um, before 2013, the number of newly registered Chinese companies have stayed low. And then it jumps to over 100 in 2014 and have stayed high since then. We see that there are declines in company registration for um, Australia, Malaysia, and India. Um, there is a slight decline among the Chinese companies, but then it's not so obvious. Looking at the value of engagement, we see that while there are a lot of Chinese companies, that their investment level has been very low. Um, this is because most large Chinese enterprises, they engage in international project contracting business rather than investing their own money. The year-to-year -year value of engagement shows that Chinese companies, they are having less international project contracting business, and at the same time, they are investing less in Papua New Guinea in the recent years. The decline actually starts before the pandemic. 
So for the sector distribution of the business activities, we can see that retail distribution and wholesale sector has the highest um, number of Chinese companies involved in the sector, followed by the construction and the transport. In comparison, we can see that Australia has a very different pattern, that high, high value added service sectors such as the real estate and financial and other professional services attracted more Australian companies. Um, moving on to the distribution of location, most foreign companies um, operate in national capital district, which is the um, big circle here. Um, that is because national capital districts have um, better um, water and energy supply, better infrastructure, and strong corporate links. But then in this district, um, only less than 1% of the population lives there. Um, the the red um, color indicates the number of Chinese companies, and we can see that their footprint is all over the country. Um, they actually play a very critical ro role in supplying essential goods and services to those rural areas um, where others are unwilling or unable to operate. Mm. So that gives Chinese companies a particularly strong influence and connections. Um, this chart was shows the big pr large presence of Chinese companies better. Um, it doesn't include companies with a non-country origin. And we see that Chinese companies account for a large share of foreign companies in many provinces and in Qingbu, Ji Jiwaka, and Helen, about four out of five foreign companies are Chinese. To understand the patterns, um, I examine factors that really contribute, uh, that possibly contribute to the patterns. Um, um, I think investment opportunities and business environments, um, this is factors um, as a reasonable business return is fundamental for companies' long term operations. Um, and we can see. Um, before the high influx of Chinese companies started in 2014, that is actually when Papua New Guinea lost its gross momentum. As the local economic development continues to stagnate, we see there is a more aligned pattern between um, Chinese companies' investment interest and uh, the general economic cycle. Uh, the declining business interest in recent years can also be caused by the regulatory changes as the government of PNG um, has introduced more constraints on foreign companies' activities. For example, the National Procurement Amendment Act in 2021 requires that uh, for government contracts over 15 million kina, um, they need to have at least 50% local content. Um, and government, government's decision to really advance its national interest has hurt a lot of foreign companies, and more wildly, it has triggered hesitation about future investment um, decisions. Um, there is one slide not shown, but basically what I'm trying to talk about is that um, over the years of experience in um, of operation in Papua New Guinea, Chinese companies, they have become more aware of the obstacles of operation in Papua New Guinea. And um, there are general obstacles faced by all the companies like the limited foreign exchange, unreliable telecommunications and utilities, poor security, law and order cha challenges, and skill shortage. Shortage, and in addition to these, Chinese companies they have reported concerns over the land use disputes, job project risk, and intensified competition among the large Chinese enterprises. And then, according to the um, China's um, the guide to Chinese overseas investment, and 
cooperation in Papua New Guinea guides. I'm just going to read it. Um, in 2021, it says PNG's foreign investment policy has tightened and the investment and business environment in Papua New Guinea has become increasingly complex. Some large foreign funded projects have been delayed and cannot be implemented for a long time, which has affected overseas enterprises discussion and promotion of projects. Um, there's mention obstacles are uh, more of concerns to large Chinese enterprises, and for Chinese small and medium enterprises, they have very different um, behaviors, and they are better at navigating the changing conditions and seeing opportunities. Chinese companies, they are also affected by the diplomatic exchanges um, between China and Papua New Guinea since 2010. Um, the meetings between the heads of states of the two countries have become a lot more frequent, and we see that as the periods that uh, we see more Chinese companies arriving. Um, there are three ways that political relations affect the Chinese companies. First, um, most Chinese people, they don't know much about the Papua New Guinea, and the political campaigns in China have been effectively promoting the opportunities in Papua New Guinea. But then in recent years, as Chinese companies start to learn more about the markets, they become more hesitant uh, about the obstacles. And second, China and Papua New Guinea has formed four pairs of sister provinces and cities that really encourage the Chinese investors from those provinces and cities to invest in Papua New Guinea. The incentives include the payment of pre-project feasibility investigation and compensation of loss during the operations. Lastly, Chinese government has provided large economic assistance um, that provides massive direct and indirect business opportunities for the Chinese companies. However, PNG has a very high debt level now, and its history of non-performing loans for the past projects has really negatively impacted the credit limits for the local government and Chinese companies to access the concessional financing. The last element is trade. Um, we see that like PNG's trade with China has um, increased over the years, um, especially for the exports. However, um, those exports are really driven by two products. One is the liquefied natural gas, and the other one is the nickel, and they are um, mainly from two projects with a limited of companies operating those projects. Um, for the issues, foreign companies, regardless of their origin, have faced wide criticisms. Um, and for Chinese companies, they have been accused the most. And that is partially because of the reason that they attract more interest from the public. Um, from the public media research and government documents, um, there have been criticisms. Um, the listed items, I, I will not go through them. Um, sorry about that. Um, and the key message I want to send here is that a lot of these issues are actually related to regulatory cha um, challenges, and which has really complicated the business environment and um, results in those criticisms that I listed before. And those regulatory challenges include the um, low policy consistency that really brings a lot of uncertainty to the project, weak rule and law enforcement, lack of transparency and accountability that, that contribute to a culture of corruption, and, and unclear land titles that sometimes put the foreign companies to be the victims. And we see some home countries have taken action to address the issues. For example, the Chinese government, they have strengthened its regulatory role. Um, however, its regulatory power has been mainly constrained to large Chinese enterprises, leaving a large number of Chinese SMEs unsupervised. Um, and then many issues are not being reported to the officials. Um, and even in some cases, when the issues are really reviewed, it is very hard for the Chinese officials to get involved because it, the issues are complicated with the local politics. And for the Chinese companies, they have attempted to issue the guiding opinions on preventing malicious loan bidding in 2020 to try to regulate the behaviors. However, it is generally very hard to expect companies to set up high standards and uh, abide by them. 
Um, so my key message would be um, from this paper and this presentation is really that um, in the past, Papua New Guinea has attracted a, a lot of foreign investment interest, a lot of company interest. However, it hasn't really capitalized on this interest and put it into the long-term development of the country. And now we see that high chance um, international attention to the Pacific that can potentially bring more development opportunities to the region. It is really important for Papua New Guinea to learn from its lessons and to really um, translate everything into long-term development of the local economy. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, our next speaker is um, Pierre Van der Ayn. Um, he will talk about um, Chinese FDI and Chinese companies in Indonesia. Pierre is an associate professor in international business and business history. Good. Good morning, everyone. Um, let me start by thanking Greg and Debbie for uh, organizing this event. Uh, I think it's, um, it's a breakthrough. Uh, it's good to discuss uh, about the presence of, uh, of Chinese companies and what uh, their presence um, uh, entails in many different countries from different disciplinary uh, backgrounds. And uh, my background is, uh, well, I'm in the Research School of Management. Uh, my, my research interest is really international business. And uh, this um, paper um, started around about eight years ago uh, when I was living in, uh, in Beijing. And um, uh, I, th I thought about things to do. What, what does one do in Beijing? Well, my idea of fun uh, was to uh, start uh, researching uh, Chinese companies, particularly in Indonesia, because most of my research relates to Indonesia. Um, and um, I had to do that uh, in order to qualify for uh, a visiting scholarship at uh, uh, Peking University, Beida. Um, and uh, I, uh, I created this research project and started researching, and uh, well, it yielded some result, the results. Now, one of the dilemmas I had is how to approach uh, the presence of Chinese companies in, uh, in Indonesia. Uh, case studies is, is one way to do it, and uh, we've uh, listened to one case study uh, yesterday. Uh, some of you will present other case studies uh, later today. The question, the issue with case studies is always, um, my apologies, the, que the issue with case studies is always, well, how to generalize them? Can they be generalized? Yeah. Um, and that is what I uh, contemplated. Uh, I, I then uh, realized, well, I need to know more about the population of Chinese firms in a host country, in this case, uh, Indonesia. Uh, how many are there? Uh, what industries are they active in? Uh, what is their size on average? Um, how much do they invest? Uh, what numbers of people do they employ, either locally or expats? Uh, what are their entry reasons, etc.? So I would like to know more about the population. Uh, I've done this before uh, when I researched uh, the presence and activities of Japanese companies in Indonesia. And I thought, well, that's, that's doable because uh, in the case of uh, Japan, there is the, the marvelous Toyo Keizai, uh Publishing Company, which every year uh, publishes a thick uh, directory of the overseas subsidiaries of Japanese companies. Uh, with names, with uh, numbers of people employed, with... Um, uh, uh, amount um, in invested, etc. Uh, easy to work with, uh, and I've done that for uh, for Indonesia, and for that matter, um, the Japanese uh, uh, Ministry of uh, uh, Econom what is it again, External Trade and Industry, uh, produces an annual survey among uh, the subsidiaries, overseas subsidiaries of Japanese companies, not by name, but at least uh, those survey results. Uh, allow us to probe even deeper. It's easy. And I, I was wondering whether there's something like that for Chinese companies uh, around the world. Well, most of you most likely know already <laughs> there isn't. Um, in the case of Indonesia, I was looking for uh, numbers. Uh, the first port of call was the uh, Indonesian Chinese Chamber of Commerce in Jakarta. Uh, its uh, list of members uh, counted 264 members. Uh, a few years ago, they, they, take, they took the list of members uh, off their website, so it's no longer there. But 264, well, that's the first number. 
The second port of call is uh, Indonesia's Investment uh, Coordination Board. Uh, all foreign investments into Indonesia uh, has to be approved by BKPM, that board. And uh, its um, published recordings uh, told me that there are more than 29,000 realized cases of investment by Chinese companies. Oh, a big, much bigger number. Uh, but almost 30,000 companies, that seems very unlikely. Um, then a, a port of call was the um, MOFCOM, the Ministry of uh, Commerce in, uh, in, uh, in Beijing. Uh, it uh, has, uh, still has a list of uh, uh, companies uh, overseas on its website. Uh, I checked it earlier this year. In Indonesia, there are now th 313. <coughs> a few years ago, it had a list of 600. Okay. <laughs> Well, uh, at least um, that gave me some names to work with, because BKPM doesn't give me any names of companies, but MOFCOM uh, does include the names of uh, subsidiary companies. But clearly, this is not consistent. Um, and that concerned me somewhat. This lack of consistent data, uh, I, I think that feeds into uh, public debates about the presence of, uh, of, of Chinese companies in Indonesia. And for that matter, uh, the, the lack of clarity uh, yeah, uh, runs the risk of uh, uh, potential misunderstandings uh, in the public debate. Um, so what to do? Uh, I set out to build my own database of uh, now 872 subsidiary firms in Indonesia of China-based uh, 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 companies, uh, which were established from 1994 to 2021. Yeah, so to a large extent, the paper builds on this uh, database that I created myself. Now, uh, this is a summary of uh, uh, my summary in the distributed uh, list of summaries <laughs> that you received. Um, so I use the uh, readily available uh, data on inward foreign direct investment uh, from China into Indonesia, and they all show a big increase from 2004 to 2021. But there is this inconsistency in these data uh, to deal with. And that uh, makes it difficult to get a good impression of uh, the activities of Chinese firms in uh, Indonesia. Is it the 30,000 according to BKPM, or is it the 300 something according to uh, MOFCOM? Um, so what I do is analyze uh, whatever data uh, are available on Chinese uh, uh, or, or FDI by Chinese companies in Indonesia. I created my own database of more than 850 uh, companies. And I also analyzed, the, for several cases, uh, the way in which they uh, arranged their financing, uh, uh, financing of projects into Indonesia. And that's important. I'll say more about that in a minute. Um, so the official FDI data, uh, my conclusion from all of that is that the official FDI data uh, Oh, I have to do it again. My conclusion from all of that is uh, that the official FDI data, either uh, Indonesian or uh, Chinese, uh, are, inc are incomplete. And the main reason for incompleteness is uh, that they don't f account for or don't fully account for what is called onward journeying of uh, Chinese uh, foreign direct investment. Onward journeying, in a sense that uh, many Chinese companies uh, they channel their investments through to the rest of the world, uh, first of all via Hong Kong, uh, in second instance possibly via Singapore, or, and that's even worse because it's very difficult to track, uh, keep track of uh, 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 companies then, via the British Virgin Islands or the Cayman Islands or other tax havens in, the, in uh, Central America. Uh, so. I, I looked at that and I then re-estimated uh, what we have in terms of uh, information about that to conclude that actually foreign direct investment into Indonesia should be much higher than what uh, both Chinese and uh, Indonesian authorities uh, lead us to believe. Secondly, I looked at um, engineering construction projects, uh, the value of engineering construction projects uh, carried out uh, in Indonesia partly on the basis of uh, the data that I collected myself, partly on the basis of uh, information that, uh, that um, uh, Chinese companies uh, submit to Chinese authorities that have to give permissions for these uh, uh, projects to be carried out. And the point there is that 
the value of uh, those engineering construction projects exceeds foreign direct investment by far. Yeah, so uh, any controversy about the presence and activities of Chinese companies in Indonesia should not just focus on FDI, it should also focus on many projects. Well, uh, several of us know that already. There are other bits in the, in the, in the paper which I will not uh, touch on if I have time uh, in this presentation. Um, uh, concentration of much of FDI on mining and uh, uh, project construction and management. The point there is that it's not focused on manufacturing industry. Yeah? Uh, when you compare uh, Chinese uh, companies operating in other countries, yes, uh, something in common is the engineering and construction projects. But in the case of Indonesia, a lot of it, a lot of it is focused on mining uh, or mineral processing, for that matter, which is manufacturing. But the point is that it's not manufacturing as in uh, low-cost, uh, labor-intensive manufacturing. Uh, so Indonesia is somewhat different there from uh, Chinese investment in other parts of uh, Southeast Asia, if not the rest of Asia. Um, issues of controversy, um, the Chinese, sorry, the Indonesian government has been relatively uh, generous in terms of uh, providing concessions for expatriate employment to Chinese uh, companies. Generally, there, is, there are restrictions on the number of uh, expats that uh, foreign companies are allowed to employ. That may start at a certain level, but then it has to decrease. Uh, in the case of Chinese companies, the level is higher. Maybe there are expectations of a decrease. We don't know exactly because uh, much of those contracts are uh, uh, commercial in confidence. Um, but it, it is significantly higher. Um, and secondly, concessions in terms of uh, the sourcing of supplies in uh, China. Some of the value added uh, in other cases, not Chinese companies, um, has to be uh, generated on the basis of supplies that are purchased locally. In the case of China, it seems that uh, the uh, Indonesian authorities have been much more um, accommodating uh, by allowing Chinese firms to uh, import uh, construction equipment and machinery uh, uh, from, uh, from China and um, uh, allowing them to import supplies as in uh, cement pipes, uh, for example, that are used in uh, drainage and uh, irrigation projects uh, uh, into, uh, into Indonesia. Something else that I discuss in the paper is that there are some spectacular um, uh, cases of failed FDI projects, companies that clearly over, uh, were far too over, far too pessim sorry, far too optimistic, of course, uh, in their assessments of the viability of their investments in Indonesia, and it didn't quite work out for them. Uh, the title uh, alludes to complementarity and contention. It's not too difficult to understand why. Uh, fi first of all, complementarity. Indonesia is a uh, uh, a grateful recipient of uh, part of the savings in China uh, which Chinese companies are able to tap uh, for foreign direct investment and also for uh, loans by Chinese banks uh, for the purpose of financing the uh, construction engineering projects in, uh, in Indonesia. And that helps to uh, develop uh, uh, Indonesia's natural resources that are used for export to China. Uh, complementarity, contention. There are two major contentious issues in uh, Indonesia's context. First of all, the significant presence of Chinese uh, workers in Indonesia. I haven't done the numbers on other countries, but I wouldn't be surprised if uh, Indonesia has been more generous. The latest count, uh, according to uh, the, the Ministry of uh, Labor, let's call it that, uh, it has a more difficult name, uh, is uh, 52,000 uh, officially uh, uh, allowed uh, Chinese workers in uh, Indonesia, but as we will hear from uh, Alfian later today, there could be many more uh, because they are working illegally. Um, and the second point of contention is uh, Indonesia's uh, growing trade deficit with China. Uh, Indonesia is importing more from China than it is exporting to China. And that's an issue for economists, uh, but it also spills over into public debate in, uh, in Indonesia. <coughs> the reason is simple. Uh, the reason uh, has to do uh, with, uh, uh, first of all, these concessions of allowing Chinese companies to import materials, uh, machinery and equipment used in uh, construction, and uh, secondly, uh, 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 
basic materials, uh, the, the cement pipes, for example, uh, uh, from, uh, from China. Um, and secondly, um, the fact that uh, Indonesia exports primary commodities, uh, agriculture and particularly mining, to, uh, to China. And the price, on average, of uh, primary commodities has fallen on global markets. So Indonesia is earning less uh, than, let's say, 10 years ago from its exports to, uh, to China. And that meant that the trade gap has opened up. And therefore, that Indonesia, not at the moment, but in near future, will have difficulties uh, footing the bill uh, when it comes to repaying the significant loans that uh, come to Indonesia's ways, way as a consequence of uh, these uh, many engineering and construction uh, projects. Um, I basically summarized my paper. I was going to go through lots of numbers, and Greg is very relieved. Uh, I'm, not going <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going through all these numbers, um, except uh, uh, this uh, summary uh, of uh, uh, the calculations uh, in the paper. Um, so um, I, I, oops, sorry. These, um, as you can see, uh, I, I uh, revised the av available data from Bank Indonesia and from the uh, Investment Coordinating uh, Agency in, uh, in Indonesia uh, in order to uh, make them more realistic. In the case of uh, the Bank Indonesia uh, estimates, what's really necessary there is uh, accounting for um, um, onward journeying foreign investment via Hong Kong, uh, via Singapore. Yeah. A lot of um, uh, foreign investment by Chinese companies goes through Singapore. Uh, basically what is happening there is that um, uh, the Chinese banks that are operating, that have a license to operate in uh, Singapore, uh, create a loan consortia. Um, there are financial companies from around the world operating in uh, Singapore for the particular purpose of uh, uh, financing investment projects uh, around Southeast Asia. Uh, Southeast Asia is seen as a, as a region, and Singapore, for many of uh, those companies, is a regional headquarter. As a consequence of that, uh, the financial industry in uh, Singapore has ballooned significantly. In order to mobilize investment from different parts of the world, put it all together and use it to finance uh, projects by foreign companies, including Chinese companies, in the rest of Southeast Asia, right? And Chinese banks uh, are specializing in um, uh, uh, putting loan consortia together to finance construction projects, but also FDI projects uh, in around Southeast Asia, particularly in, in Indonesia. So one has to account for Singapore, uh, which Bank Indonesia doesn't do. It only identifies Singapore as a source of uh, uh, FDI without uh, uh, relating uh, the FDI uh, from Singapore to uh, the companies and the, uh, the home country of the companies that organize their finance through Singapore. Um, and BKPM da uh, data, the investment board data, have to be updated uh, uh, because BKPM does not approve uh, investment, uh, downstream investment in uh, oil and gas, and it doesn't approve uh, investment in Indonesia's financial sector. So that leads me to conclude that actually there's more uh, information, uh, sorry, there's more foreign investment uh, related to the activities of uh, uh, Chinese companies in Indonesia than the official Indonesian data account for. Yeah? And uh, it shows that uh, Chinese firms uh, have become Indonesia's biggest source of FDI during the last few years. Um, there's more that I can say about numbers. Uh, do quiz me on that when it comes to uh, asking questions. Thank you. Thank you, Pierre. So um, Greg yeah, will offer his comments yeah, on the three brilliant presentations. Well, who doesn't love numbers? <laughs> Uh, thanks, Pierre. I know now why I was invited to a conference run by UBS Bank in Singapore two weeks ago to talk about Southeast Asian politics. I had no idea what most of the people in the room did. Now I know. So thank you for that. Um, 
three very rich presentations. Of course, it's incredibly useful to have this generalised macro picture data. We've had a lot of very rich case studies, but uh, getting some um, overviews uh, are, are incredibly useful. So starting with Sharon's, um, lots, lots of um, gaps, it seems, in what we know about companies, not only um, that came out of uh, Pierre's presentation, but also Sharon's. And I was surprised to see that there's 20% of the companies in, in, in P&G that we don't actually know what uh, nationality they're, they're, they're from. Um, more broadly, I found the, um, your presentation had a lot, uh, had a number of surprising um, facts. One was that uh, retail distribution and wholesale dominates um, Chinese um, company presence in PNG. I, I would have thought it would just certainly be mining. Um, so that, that was surprising, but interesting. One observational, one question. Um, you mentioned a jump in, uh, in investment around 2013. Of course, that's when Xi Jinping announced the BRI. So one does wonder, is that, uh, 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 is that the relationship? Is, it, is that causal? And uh, you also mentioned, of course, that there's large economic assistance from, from the uh, Chinese government. So this does suggest that there was a shift in um, strategy uh, or, 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 or the priority of uh, the Pacific Islands uh, and particularly PNG from the Chinese government. And, of course, uh, that's an argument which um, um, I've seen put um, by some other scholars. So interested if you have time to address that. Um, interesting that PNG introduced the uh, law on uh, constraining for foreign FDI. I hadn't heard about that. 50% um, local content does seem to be quite a demanding um, constraint um, for any project over 50 million. Uh, I presume that means in terms of, uh, you know, I mean, it actually would be interesting to know exactly what local content means. Does that mean local workforce or local supply to the project and so, so on and so forth? Anyway, uh, a really interesting project um, and uh, paper. Then Lynn and Shaka, um, who doesn't like some good positivist social science? Um, it was a really, really interesting paper, a really important topic. Um, uh, um, oh, just before I go to Lynn and Shaka, just one other thing that I think would be interesting, Sharon, in your paper would be to document where there's been violence or unrest. Um, I, I don't think I saw that in your paper. Where has there actually been clashes across PNG? How often are they occurring? Where are they occurring? And, and so forth. I thought that would be interesting to, to see. But um, FDI and, and human rights violations, and, and it looks like there's um, a very thorough um, methodology for this paper. Um, the question is very interesting. Does China accelerate uh, autocratization or de-democratization? Um, and those schools of thought, the race to the bottom or, um, or, or the race to the top, were very interesting. I was curious about why, um, I guess, trade union density was uh, chosen as a kind of proxy for human rights. Um, it does occur to me that in a number of countries you have state-sanctioned trade unions that actually don't do a great job. Uh, but they'll have high levels of membership, but you won't necessarily have high levels of protection. So obviously, trade unions in China, trade unions in Cambodia, uh, they're not necessarily doing a great job in terms of protecting worker rights. They're doing more to protect what the government's interests are. Uh, so that's, uh, that was something that was interesting. Um, I did um, also wonder whether or not, you know, you've got a kind of causation versus correlation uh, question to address, whether or not, you know, you can... You, I mean, you, you have suggested a mechanism, but whether or not you actually need um, some um, case studies to actually illustrate what your... What, whether or not those mechanisms are actually being observed in practice. Um, I wondered why you aren't looking at land dispossession. Because if you look at where China's investing, particularly in Southeast Asia, where I spend a lot of time looking, that is one of the major sources of the deprivation of human rights, that people basically have their land grabbed. Um, and that 
you know, does seem to be something that happens um, when you have um, corrupt governments or governments that are, that are um, authoritarian and they get uh, Chinese investment, it's very easy to pe for people to be shoved off the land. Uh, so that seems potentially uh, another interesting direction. And then Pierre's paper, uh, I couldn't help but think, um, wouldn't bureaucracies and public servants around the world love it if academics went and did their job for them uh, in terms of collecting data on, you know, how many companies are in a particular place. I um, mean, I think it's a great thing that you've done. It's obviously very useful um, that, um, that we now have a, a more accurate picture and, uh, and, and you know, quite surprising to know that there is this rubberiness about uh, levels of FDI because these are things that... Um, uh, international relations scholars, security scholars quote with, um, you know, great regularity, great frequency. They talk about, you know, well, China's FDA is increasing, it's about to overtake Japan's and so forth. But in course, what you're showing is that that observation can be quite flawed. Um, I'm curious to know why um, China hasn't taken steps to actually monitor uh, some of those statistics in the same way that uh, Japan does, given that China's often seen to sort of compete with Japan. And then on the question of onward forwarding, uh, which was really interesting, I guess I wondered, is that uh, standard practice and would that also apply to other countries' investments? For example, is the figure for Japan's investment uh, also being distorted because some of those companies would be working through uh, Singapore or, uh, or many companies, of course, we know many Western companies, many American companies are offshoring to avoid tax. Uh, we know Microsoft does it, Apple do it, and so on and so forth. So is that, is that a broader pattern um, of behaviour? But um, uh, And then lastly, I just wondered, it was interesting to hear that so much of Indonesian exports are going relatively unprocessed. And of course, I'm aware that my colleague um, Eve Warburton has worked a lot on, t on Indonesian resource nationalism, uh, and that seems to uh, um, produce in Indonesia a sort of policy imperative to try and get more value add onto their exports. Uh, is that not yet? Um, uh, achieving any results. But three great papers, and let me hand over for now for questions.